Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have the lucky advantage of two excellent speakers today, which we don't always have, but our first speaker is Elaine Mills. She created the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants, which is a very popular feature of our website. She has spent the past 10 years photographing native plants in public and private gardens and uses her pictures in her presentations and on her social media posts. In addition, Elaine serves as one of the coordinators of the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden in Arlington. And uh, we call her our tried and true speaker because she does so many of these wonderful presentations. Our second speaker is Elizabeth Colleton, who Elaine mentored as part of her um, internship to become a master gardener, which she did this year. And Elizabeth, along with a classmate, created a series of short videos and garden signage, specifically about gardening tips to help mitigate and adapt to climate change. She has been an active volunteer at our demonstration gardens and is also applying uh, her new knowledge to her own home landscape and garden. In addition, Elizabeth is a board member on the Arlington Friends of Urban Agriculture, where she focuses on school gardening programs and is a mentor to students at Washington Liberty High School. Good morning, you all, and thank you very much, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Colleen, and thank you also to Jason and Leslie, who are helping facilitate the behind the scenes. Uh, Welcome everyone and thank you so much for your patience as we get started this morning with our next presentation on sustainable landscaping. Professor David Wolf in his writings and on, in a podcast, um, he is an expert uh, on dealing with climate change. And he has commented that we are really the first generation of gardeners who cannot rely on historical weather records to give us guidance. Our goal for today's presentation is to give you an overview of these challenging new conditions that we're facing. And then we'd like to share with you some practical actions that we can all take in response to make our gardens more sustainable and more resilient. Elizabeth will be introducing you to the first strategies, which include reducing your carbon footprint, managing water wisely, building your soil, and rethinking your lawn. Then I will return to talk about making informed choices of plants and introducing some next steps and resources. Climate change is uh, happening because of glo global warming. This occurs because of the buildup of greenhouse gases that are trapped in our atmosphere. And the most abundant of these gases is carbon dioxide, CO2, which results from fossil fuel combustion and deforestation. We hear a lot about this when we're talking about uh, carbon sequestration. Methane is less abundant than carbon dioxide, but it is about 28 times more potent. It results uh, from fossil fuel production, our agricultural processes, and is emitted from landfills. Nitrous oxide, another very potent gas, uh, comes from fertilizer application, the burning of both fossil fuels and plant-based materials and industrial processes. And finally, ozone is formed by a reaction between nitrous oxide and the volatile organic compounds. These so-called VOCs are gases that are emitted from different products. They could be household products like cleaners, solvents, air fresheners, uh, dry cleaning of clothes, uh, some uh, building materials, uh, office uh, printers and copiers, that kind of thing. There are many measurable changes that are indicators of this warming world. And uh, quite a few of them are going, these measures are going up. We're seeing an increase of temperature over land, over the ocean and of the ocean water itself. There's also increasing humidity and we are definitely hearing about the sea level rising. 
Now in our region, we may not be noticing these changes, but we certainly hear about them. The reduction in the size of glaciers, snow cover and permafrost, as well as ice sheets and sea ice. One quick point to make is the distinction between weather and climate. Weather is all of these factors on any given day, whereas climate is prevalent long-term weather conditions in a particular place. So one of the patterns, these long-term patterns that we have been tracking is a trend of warming in every season. And just a few highlights from a national oceanographic uh, and atmospheric uh, administration reports. Back in uh, January of 2020, for example, winter was seven degrees above normal. Just last year in uh, Death Valley, California, we broke the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth in July. It was 130 degrees. And simultaneously, up in the Pacific Northwest, numerous tem uh, temperature records were broken by at least 10 degrees. And the predictions for this year uh, include warmer than average overnight temperatures. Now, we tend to talk about breaking these, uh, these weather extremes on the high end, but climate change actually exacerbates temperature extremes in both directions. So we can have higher highs and lower lows. In uh, a column that uh, our, our local columnist uh, on the, in the Washington Post, Adrian Higgins uh, posted, he was talking about changes in the USDA hardiness zones. And these planting zones are shifting northward. For example, in the DC metro area, we previously have been considered to be in zone seven. And now it, it appears that zone eight is moving up to our region. This at, uh, was previously located around Virginia Beach, 200 miles further south. And of course, these changes have an effect on both our vegetable and ornamental gardening. Uh, another pattern that we're perceiving is um, an increase in the number of stagnant weather days, 83% uh, increase since 1973. And this occurs because the temperature in the Arctic is warming at about twice the rate of the rest of the globe. And this has a, an impact on the jet stream, particularly on uh, weather in the Northern Hemisphere. So as this uh, Arctic is warming and the jet stream is uh, slowing down, air masses will remain over a given geographic region for an extended period of time. And uh, the pattern can last for days or even weeks and lead to all of these weather extremes. Um, one very familiar example is the devastating Hurricane Harvey that brought over 40 inches of rain in a four day period, causing unprecedented flooding in Houston in August of 2017. Uh, beginning to look at what's happening with weather in each of the seasons. Uh, the fluctuation in this jet stream uh, also brings about other types of, of anomalous weather patterns. There can be rapid shifts from bone chilling cold to unseasonably warm weather. Uh, one example, uh, some friends living out in Colorado posted on Facebook back in 2020. In, uh, on the 6th of September, they were experiencing temperatures around 100 degrees. And just three days later, it was measuring 23 degrees with snow. Another familiar example more recently uh, in Texas last year, the entire state was under their first ever winter storm warning. Uh, locally, uh, we are, are noting in general, uh, less slow accumulation from year to year, but last year was an example of more extreme weather with double the typical snowfall uh, and damaging winds. Uh, ice can cause entire branches to split off. Heavy snow can bend, especially our evergreen plants. And the, uh, the poor uh, arborvitae shrub shown in the picture on the right was mine after a big storm. I did my best to brush off the snow, but the, the shrub was really permanently damaged. Now we're noting in many regions that winter is warming faster than any other season. 
And this is bringing about what we might term season creep or a blurring of the line between winter and spring. So this means that plants are emerging too early. They're tricked by the rising winter temperatures and then they can turn around and be frozen by late season cold snaps in March and April. An example here in our region was very low temperatures in late March that meant that our magnolia blossoms were, were totally killed. And this of course uh, introduces um, a perplexing situation for our vegetable gardeners. They may be tempted with the warm temperatures to begin putting out their vegetable starts only to have them all killed off with that late season uh, cold snap. Another problem is that plants and emerging insects and migrating birds may no longer be in sync. Plants may often rely on increasing day length as spring approaches the solstice, whereas animals may be tempted to emerge with the warming temperatures and their emergence may not match. Also, um, we're noting that allergy season is beginning earlier. Now, many folks are excited about the balmy winter days, forgetting that in our temperate region, uh, historically, we've had very distinct seasons. We, and our plants especially, need winter. Um, the fruit and nut trees require a certain number of what are referred to as chill hours, a period of dormancy with cold weather in order for them to be getting ready to produce flowers and then fruit. The seeds of some of our native plants, uh, this example here is of Joe Pieweed, they require cold temperatures for germination. And uh, sugar maples require cold for the sap to be produced, the sap that we enjoy as maple syrup. Moving on to summer, uh, just here in this local area, these are changes that have occurred uh, well within my lifetime. I'm a Washington DC native. In 1960, there were only 18 days of temperature above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. By 2017, uh, 30 days, and then in 2019, it more than doubled, 62 days above 90 degrees. In July of 2020, uh, we recorded the most 90 degree days of any month ever on record with uh, the nighttime temperatures uh, not falling very low either. And in September of that same year, that was the warmest September we'd ever had. Uh, and there were numerous weather related disasters. Uh, heat of course has an effect on our landscape plants at temperatures in the 90s and 100s, uh, photosynthesis is slowed but respiration of the plant still continues depleting their food reserves. High temperatures can cause severe water loss, sunburn can occur on plants as well as animals, and a continuous extreme heat can cause death. As far as our vegetable plants, uh, most of them actually grow best in a range of temperatures between 59 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Pollen production and viability are greatly reduced with prolonged heat and growth of plants is significantly slowed with sustained high temperatures. This means that there will be more spindly growth and the plants are under stress and uh, more prone to uh, fall prey to diseases and pests. Signs of this kinds of stress include leaf rolling and cupping, wilting of the entire plant, fruit set failure, bolting, and sun scald. And another problem is that the increase in nighttime temperatures limits the plant's daytime recovery. Now we're very aware of the mega drought that is occurring in the Western part of the country. I understand uh, from recent reading that there's been several decades of weather that really hasn't been experienced in 1200 years. Uh, here, back in 2019, we experienced uh, the most se severe drought uh, in recent history, a moderate drought over 62% of Virginia after several months of below average rainfall. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, during the summer, we're also experiencing increased heavy precipitation events. 
Uh, in our region, these events have uh, increased by 27% since the 1950s. And just two recent examples uh, uh, are the severe flooding that occurred in Arlington, Virginia in July 2019, and the third highest high tide bringing about flooding in Alexandria, Virginia a little bit later. That was in October of last year. Moving on into fall, we're noticing a greatly lengthened growing season. Uh, in our region, uh, vegetable gardeners can enjoy six additional days to the growing season on average. Unfortunately, this uh, longer season gives an advantage to non-native invasive plants and insect pests. Uh, delayed bird migration, uh, as we experienced with uh, spring weather, um, results uh, in a mismatch with ripening fruits on plants. Fall leaf drop may be delayed only to have snowfall uh, occur before the leaves have dropped. At this point, uh, I'll answer any questions, Colleen. Okay, Elaine, thank you. Um, there are a couple. The first set is about composting and greenhouse gases. Uh, the first part of the question was, does composting cause greenhouse, greenhouse gases? And secondly, uh, does vermicomposting uh, cause greenhouse gases? And if so, which ones? And uh, Really, on, on the other end, those, that process, the composting, is helping us to sequester carbon as opposed to releasing carbon. And uh, when I hand things over to Elizabeth, she'll be talking about composting in much greater detail as a really beneficial practice to address climate change. Okay, there was kind of an interesting question about garlic. Garlic needs uh, cold to develop bulbs. As our climate gets warmer, do people need to do some other cold stratification uh, process, do you think? Mm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a good question. And I have to admit that I am an ornamental gardener as opposed to a vegetable gardener. So any questions like this that uh, I'm not able to address, I will be sure to answer those in detail in writing in an addendum document that I will be sending out to all of the participants uh, okay. after our, our program is recorded. Thank you, Elaine. And the last one is kind of a it's a little bit of a philosophical question. If uh, plant habitats are shifting northward because of climate change, uh, is that gonna change the array of what's considered native plants? Yeah, this is a whole topic that, uh, that I was going to um, address in the section on talking about plants. So maybe I can uh, return to that then. Okay, thank you, Elaine. That was good for questions. All right, very good. I'd like now to uh, hand the program over to my friend and Master Gardener colleague, Elizabeth Colleton. That was a great setup and, um, you know, also a really sobering set of facts, right, that we're, we're dealing with um, in, a, in a period of climate change and we're, we're trying to be successful gardeners. So our goal here today, of course, we're, you know, we recognize that that we need a lot of really big picture and global approaches to mitigate and, and deal with climate change. Um, but our goal here today is to, uh, as Elaine said, give you some really practical strategies uh, for how to be a successful gardener um, in a climate change context and to, you know, cope with, you know, contribute what we can to solutions, but also to, to cope with the very real um, climate change impacts that we are all experiencing. So I'll talk about two right now uh, before we head to our next Q&A session. And uh, the first one is really, you know, what gardeners can do to reduce their carbon footprint in the garden. The, the primary piece of advice is to switch away from those gas powered machines that we um, use, our weed whackers, our leaf blowers, our, our lawn mowers. Um, and the primary reason is that they are, they're big emitters of greenhouse gases and pollutants. Um, for our waterways, um, they uh, contribute to about 17 million gallons of gas spills across the country every year. This is way more than was spilled in the entire Exxon Valdez oil spill back in 1989. Um, you can see that gas uh, mowers take up, a, you know, use a huge amount of gasoline every year. 
And um, the advice here is to really switch to battery powered uh, or human powered tools. And I will just put in a plug for uh, the battery powered tools. They've come a long way in the past five to seven years, just in terms of uh, battery life, battery storage and ease of use. And a quick Google search will show you that you know, the, the industry has really expanded way beyond just um, gas mowers to include trimmers, um, even chainsaws, leaf blowers, weed whackers, and the like. The second strategy that we want to talk about, and someone just raised it in the, in the chat, is the, um, the need to compost organic waste. Why is this a carbon reduction strategy? Well, it's because of the fact that the municipal solid waste stream um, at, is at least uh, about a third organic material when you look at food waste and yard waste together. When you add paper and wood, it gets closer to 60%. And in parts of the country where um, we're not incinerating that waste, which has its own issues, that waste does tend to sit in landfills where it does not degrade uh, very quickly and it does generate methane gas, which is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas, as Elaine mentioned. Furthermore, composting does help store um, soil carbon. And um, that's an important uh, thing that we'll talk about later when we talk about soil in depth. And um, the, the idea here is to just continue uh, sequestering soil uh, carbon in our soils. We're lucky where we live to be able to participate in pretty um, you know, user-friendly composting programs, either through Arlington County or I think the city of Alexandria. So you can either compost at home if you choose to do that. There's plenty of how-tos on the MGNB website. Um, or if you live in Arlington, you can just put it out with your regular trash in the, in the green cart. The third strategy in terms of cutting carbon is to think about all the light bulbs that we leave on at night. And the, the default I would propose is that we keep our gardens dark at night. I know that landscape lighting has become very in vogue over the past 10 or 15 years here in Arlington. Um, but I think we all need to take a moment to remember that everybody needs a break at night, including the insects and the birds and even the plants. Um, new satellite imagery out of, the, uh, uh, out of Iowa State University is showing that in urban areas, deciduous trees actually respond to um, exterior urban lighting, uh, causing buds to open up earlier in the springtime and leaf color to um, start later, leaf color change to start later in the fall. So the idea is if you can, um, leave your garden dark at night. If you have to have light, of course, we uh, suggest using solar powered lights um, using yellow or red tinted LED bulbs to stay away from that blue part of the color spectrum, which is responsible for uh, drawing insects um, into toward the light bulbs. Um, of course, installing automatic light timers can do a lot. You can have your light while you're sort of awake, but they'll go off at, at night when you go to bed. Or just use um, safety motion sensor lights if you're concerned about safety. Um, so the, I just put a plug in here for the International Dark Sky Association, which has a lot of information about the importance of dark skies to everything from migrating birds to insects. And if you, again, if you do a quick Google search of retailers, more and more of them are offering um, dark sky lighting, which basically, as this photo in the lower right shows, um, it's called fully shielded lighting and it directs the light to the ground rather than up into the skies. So that's preferable to um, the landscape lighting that shines through our trees at night. The next strategy is to simply discontinue the use of toxic chemicals in your garden. Chief among the reasons is that fossil fuel resources are used both in the manufacturer and in the, as components in many of the chemicals that we use in our gardens. These chemicals, of course, have um, impacts on non-target plants and beneficial insects like honeybees. Um, and uh, they're many times just sprayed indiscriminately. Uh, we don't need to talk about the toxicity to humans and animals. That should be self or, uh, readily apparent. Um, but the impact that these chemicals have on ongoing pollution to soil and water um, cannot be overstated. So 
Consequently, the next strategy we talk about is how you just employ sustainable gardening methods in your own back 40, right? Um, we recommend that you use mechanical and cultural control for weeds. So that can include examining your vegetable plants for obvious predators and plucking them off or taking uh, diseased leaves off. Um, encouraging beneficial insects to come to your garden. You can see that photograph of the ladybug chomping away on all of those aphids. Um, it's, it's a good reminder that your garden itself is kind of its own ecosystem. And if you allow beneficial predator insects in, you're going to obviate the need for a lot of those chemical uh, sprays that many of us have been, uh, become accustomed to. You can use protective row covers to keep in, uh, insects off of vulnerable plants. Um, for mosquito control, which is a huge issue here in Northern Virginia, we recommend, of course, uh, addressing standing water issues as early in the, uh, in the season as you can, and then using uh, mosquito dunks that are non-chemical, they're uh, bacteria-based, to control and stop mosquito, uh, mosquitoes from breeding. Um, and then finally, we talk about the need to avoid uh, this class of insecticides in the garden called neonicotinoids. And these are the chemicals that are, have a systemic impact on the plant, all the way from roots to foliage and fruit, that have um, widespread um, effects on honeybees and other pollinators. And they are, um, you know, they're water soluble plants, they're recommended application rates in, in home gardens is sometimes 120 times that recommended in agricultural settings. So the, um, the pollution from neonicotinoids is extensive and the damage on the ecosystem is extensive. So we recommend uh, looking carefully at labels and not using those products. And then the final uh, point for sustainable gardening methods, and you'll probably hear me say this several times during this presentation, is to just keep adding compost and organic material to your garden um, to enrich your soil. Another technique that you can do to reduce your carbon footprint, rather, is to avoid peat-based potting mixes and pots. Why is that? Well, peatlands around the world are a massive carbon sink. Uh, they store a huge amount of soil carbon. As you can imagine, it has taken millennia um, to develop this particular peat land that we're looking at in this photograph. And obviously, uh, we're re-releasing re a lot of uh, soil carbon back into the atmosphere when we, um, when we harvest peat. Um, in your garden, if you're looking for improved drainage, which is what peat is not normally used for, you can use uh, leaf or um, com leaf mulch or compost, or you can use uh, renewable coconut um, fiber pots like, like this kind. I'm sure everyone has seen these at their garden store. Another tip is to avoid plastic garden pots. Uh, these are ubiquitous uh, for gardeners, obviously. Uh, the problem is that they are a type of plastic that municipal solid waste recycling programs generally do not accept for recycling. Uh, we have learned of limited uh, recycle, take back and reuse project, um, programs at various super stores, but we recommend that you call and see if those programs are still active, especially um, you know, during this time of COVID when everything seems to be uh, upside down. Um, uh, the sunny spot on the horizon is that a lot, of, um, a lot of people, a lot of innovators are realizing that these um, types of products need to be phased out and they are responding in the market with alternative uh, biodegradable options that are made out of paper, uh, rusk, rice husks and hulls, bamboo, lignin, uh, wood fiber, and our favorite, the <laughs> cow manure uh, or the cow pots. <laughs> and uh, I found out that these are uh, being marketed by a, a small family owned dairy farm in Connecticut, uh, which also happens to run a, a, a podcast about cow pots. Um, but you can imagine that there is no better sort of biodegradable option than something like this. So that uh, leads us to the next major strategy for um, uh, addressing climate change as a gardener. And this is um, 
the section on managing water wisely will give you some some tips to sort of uh, alter your routines or um, take further steps to manage what is starting to be a pretty pervasive cycle of um, intense and sudden and violent storms in our area, um, often characterized by just massive volumes of water, uh, which pose problems for not only our gardens, but our, our whole county infrastructure with impacts on our streams, our surface waters, and the Chesapeake Bay. So at the garden level, uh, some easy to learn uh, tips and tricks include just knowing exactly you know, how much your plantscape needs in terms of water. The general idea is that most plants need about an inch of water a week. If you've taken advantage of the street tree program and you've adopted a street tree um, with one of these characteristic gator bags, uh, you may have to give them 15 to 20 gallons a week uh, for the first few years, especially in the hot summer months. Uh, newly established shrubs also need extra water. And of course, those veggie gardens, veggie gardeners among us know that um, water is critical. Um, both consistency wise and amounts uh, in the developmental stage of our vegetable gardens. There are things that gardeners can do to sort of um, adjust how much water they need to apply to their garden. Uh, obviously paying attention to recent rainfall uh, by using a rain gauge can help you increase or decrease the amount of water that you um, apply in your garden. For those of us who um, may be doing container gardening, uh, don't forget the old finger test. You can sort of stick your finger down deep into the soil. Um, and if you're feeling moisture, um, you can, you can, you, you don't have to water right away. But if it's dry, that's a sign that you should be watering those container pots. And obviously in the hot summer months, they need it more often than not. Um, if you don't want to use your finger, you can use one of these uh, handy uh, moisture meters. Uh, some of us have learned the old tuna can trick, which um, or or a water flow meter, which can help us avoid overwatering, um, so that we make sure that we give our plants the recommended amount of water. Uh, at the end of the day, the key point is to uh, water deeply and consistently, but hopefully not that frequently. So a deep water is better than just sort of spraying your plants with a little bit of surface water. Gardeners can also conserve water by modifying your schedule. When you water matters, uh, in our climate, try to water early in the morning, get it all done by 10 a.m. and try not to water um, in the evening when uh, we have these hot, humid nights that Elaine was talking about, um, where we're not really getting the cool, the cool summer evenings anymore. And leaving water on your foliage is kind of an invitation to um, disease. So try to get your watering done in the morning. Hand water if you can. Install drip irrigation to uh, minimize evaporation and water consumption if possible. Uh, use those irrigation bags on new trees if you can. And um, to the extent possible, avoid that overhead uh, watering through sprinklers and, and even hose attachments, again, which uh, contribute to um, conditions that can lead to uh, fungal diseases. And if you do it in the middle of the day, it can actually burn your foliage um, in the hot sun. So this next screen, this next slide really talks about the importance of, uh, you know, infrastructure basically um, in helping gardeners in our area deal with this swing that we seem to be experiencing between uh, you know, drought and then deluge. And the use of rain barrels and cisterns can really come in handy in many, um, in many situations. Basically, you're collecting rainwater um, as a reserve for watering your plants later. You're also capturing rainwater uh, and avoiding having it kind of flood your garden or flood your yard. Um, an easy calculation to do in your head is that a thousand square foot roof can shed about 600 gallons of water for every inch of rain that falls during a rainstorm. So that's a lot of water um, that you can capture. And 
on both the Arlington County website and the MGNV website, there's a lot of information on uh, you know, the proper setup and maintenance of these systems. You obviously want to place them on sturdy uh, raised bases for the most part. And you wanna make sure that you use uh, those mosquito dunks and, and kind of a fine mesh covering, especially on the, the individual rain barrels at the top of the screen to ensure that you're not breeding mosquitoes. Uh, but these are, these are uh, approaches that can um, have a home use as well as um, a larger institutional use. We have a couple of these at the Glen Carlin Library. Um, and there's no reason why something like this could not be employed in um, apartment complexes or, or condo areas. Another strategy for managing um, our new climate, which is sometimes very dry, sometimes very wet, is to position your plants around your landscape um, in a smart way so that you're taking advantage of uh, proximity to water. So on the left, you can see um, this gardener has put placed uh, food crops near the house and ostensibly near the water supply. Whereas the garden on the right is perhaps a, you know, an example of some xeriscaping, which um, features drought tolerant plants like these yarrows and um, ornamental grasses and daisies, which can uh, endure uh, harsher drought conditions. So this leads us into the next issue, which is why these storm events are so, um, so intense and so problematic for uh, our region. And that is because uh, over the years, as we have gone from obviously a, a, a rural or agricultural um, setting to an, a residential and urban area, the amount of our ground has become much more impervious to rain. Um, in urban areas, it's as much as 85% of the ground is covered by impervious surfaces. So what does that mean for groundwater? Well, it just means that when you have this rain, it, you know, the, the rain is going to get to the surface water body as quickly as it can, and it skates right over the, the pavements and the sidewalks and, and the big uh, office building roofs as fast as possible, um, creating a huge problem for uh, stormwater runoff. Um, additionally, as Arlington and Alexandria have densified in terms of residential development, we've seen the size of houses increase and um, by extension, the size of yards decrease uh, as much as 26%. And so you have more water uh, that needs to find a place to go. The idea here is that uh, we want, the, the goal should be to Pre uh, prevent sediment and pollutants from being carried into our streams and into the Chesapeake Bay because these excess fertilizers and excess sediments are the elements that are choking the bay. They are um, adding, they're contributing to hypoxic zones, which in turn decrease the health of our important bay grasses and the uh, crabs and oysters that depend on um, clean water in the bay. So the idea, again, is to capture and filter as much runoff as you can on your own property. And we'll show you a couple of ideas of how to do that. So back to the idea of reducing impermeable surfaces. What does that mean? Well, uh, you could take apart your driveway. You could look at paved areas that are currently paved and replace them with permeable materials. Those would be pervious concretes, which are more of an aggregate type of material that allow water to filter through um, and into the groundwater. You can use swept sand pavers. You can um, put uncemented brick uh, down on your patio. Uh, again, all of these ideas are meant to slow the movement of, of stormwater runoff and allow that water to kind of penetrate the ground, which is where it's going to feed the trees and feed the plants and, and not contribute to stormwater runoff problems. Um, for, at, a, at an infrastructure level, um, here are two examples of green roofs and green walls. Again, the idea is that, um, you know, if this were a traditional roof, that water would just be heading for the drain pipes and down to the parking lots. Uh, as it is, the plants are taking advantage of all that rainwater and, um, providing other benefits um, to the environment and to the, to the stormwater system. 
Many of us know that we uh, can have occasional or even persistent ponding and flooding issues in our yards. And there are certain uh, things to know about that. The, the general uh, rule is that um, water in your yard, even if it has ponded after a storm, should dissipate after about three days. In the meantime, avoid walking around or working on that wet ground because uh, you'll just compact the soil and um, destroy much of the soil structure. So if you're if you're in a situation where that ponding is not uh, you know resolving itself, um, you'll have to take some bigger steps to address that. One idea is to continue to add organic matter. I told you I would say this more than once, and here's the second time. Um, adding organic matter to soils makes it more permeable and allows stormwater to filter through. In urban areas like we're in, where some of our gardens are close to streets, where there is you know, uh, motor oil and gasoline in those uh, stormwater events, we recommend using raised beds to avoid uh, the washover of pollutants onto your food crops. And similarly to use uh, wood chips um, on pathways to slow the movement of stormwater. If you have a persistent problem with stormwater, uh, we advise looking into the possibility of creating a rain garden. And basically what you're doing is looking at the part of your property where water um, regularly collects after rains and um, design a rain garden that is, is meant to uh, support plants and hopefully pollinators and other wildlife uh, from dry periods through a, a, a rain event, through periodic flooding. And um, the idea is to capture that, that runoff from, uh, from the downspout as it goes downslope. On the Arlington County website, and if you just Google this also, I think we have it on the MGNB website, there's plenty of information on the proper construction of a rain garden. You have to do um, various different layers to uh, you know, encourage that water to collect and eventually settle out. Um, and that would in, in include soil layers, sand layers, um, and, uh, and usually some rocks. But the, you know, the, the benefit of doing something like this is that you're, you can collect up to 200 gallons of water uh, during one of these massive rain events. Um, and that is no small change for those of us who live in these uh, rather small Arlington lots. If you have really severe ponding issues, flooding issues, um, and need, need to bring in the professionals, again, there's plenty of information on the Arlington County website, including webinars and resources for understanding um, you know, what's involved in doing bigger projects like French drains, um, grading, uh, swales, and, and drywalls. That's sort of above our pay grade here, but the county does have a, an interest in um, addressing our stormwater management problems. So we're, we'll pause here for a second or a few minutes, um, Colleen, to see if there are any questions about either of those two um, strategies. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, there were a bunch of uh, kind of questions and comments on the fact that landscape companies often use gas powered machinery, probably cause much more trouble than homeowners and are there any strategies to get them to not do that there was one person mentioned an organization called quiet clean nova apparently that is working on this and someone else thought there might be federal regulations coming down the pike that could help this but do you have any other um comments on that well, this is, you know, this is the bane of living in the suburbs, right, with all of these gas powered um, machines. The only thing I can say is that the market is starting to respond um, to the promise of these battery powered alternatives. And I know that I think in the district, they've actually decided to ban these gas powered leaf blowers and it, it will you know, it will require the, the industry to change its ways, it will pose different challenges, but um, you know, Virginia is not alone. In fact, Virginia is one of the leading states um, that has a uh, net zero um, 
carbon emissions uh, goal by 2045. And so we are going to be encouraging and Dominion Power is already in the sort of massive upgrade of its um, wind and solar investment um, as a result of the Virginia Clean Energy Act in 2019, I think, um, to make the, make the energy grid uh, you know, more electrified and more supportive of battery storage and battery powered um, you know, products, everything from cars to, you know, to uh, lawn equipment. So um, I think it's, you know, it's a piece by piece. I, I guess the recommendation is to talk to your lawn care company and ask them if they would consider um, switching to these new, these new products that are available. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a, you know, that, that's probably going to be a gradual um, improvement over time. A good point, because the more people that do that, the more they'll Pay attention, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was surprised to find that you can actually get a, a battery-powered chainsaw, of all things. I, I was sort of blown <laughs> away by that. The lawnmower, I get. The chainsaw, I was a little dubious, but there it is. <laughs> um, there was a question about whether rainwater collected from the roof is a, can you drink it? No. Okay. Do not drink the rainwater on your, from your roof. <laughs> Um, there was another question about a construction of a rain garden, but I know you said that there's a good uh, description on our website, so I won't go into that. But there was a second question about rain gardens, whether after a couple of years, do you need to uh, nourish it in some way with special soil or any other, any other process that needs to be done after you've had a rain garden for a couple of years? You know, hopefully if it has been constructed properly, um, it should hold, but you know, you, you're going to be the best judge. If it's not draining, then it's not working because what you don't want is a, a pond of stagnant water in your backyard. So uh, I guess in the worst case scenario, you might have to go back and re-excavate and maybe expand that zone of stone or sand um, or soil that really helps that sort of hydraulic uh, you know, flow of water, um, you know, after a day or so. So yeah, the, I wouldn't say that they are completely trouble proof, but if done properly at the outset, I think uh, I know people have been happy with them. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, we can go back to the presentation. Okay, fantastic. So the third strategy for um, you know, becoming a climate conscious gardener is uh, focusing on the need to build your soil. And many gardeners and of course, uh, many farmers, you know, go by the old adage that you're not actually feeding your plants, you're feeding your soil. So what does this mean? Uh, a quick kind of soil 101 um, demonstration here reminds us that a healthy sample of soil is about 50% the, you know, the mineral makeup in your region that makes up your soil, that sort of sand and silt and clay and loam that characterizes the soil for us here in the, in the Piedmont. Um, but 50% of that sample is going to be kind of open pore spaces that allow the all important air and water to exchange across those barriers to make that soil that sort of rich and crumbly, um, you know, loamy soil that uh, is so conducive to healthy plant growing. And I would direct your attention to the fact that, you know, in terms of the organic content of a, of a healthy soil sample, we're really only talking about 5% of that total, right? So uh, a, a little bit of attention to adding organic content to uh, your soil goes a long way. Now, of course, where we live, um, you know, in Northern Virginia, we, many of us um, live with the reality of really compacted soil. I mean, we have a legacy of uh, construction and foot traffic and a lot of development here that has over time really uh, taken us further away from that kind of Shangri-La of, you know, yummy, crumbly black soil. In, uh, in effect, our soil particles are quite pressed together. That kind of beige tan area shows that blocky, almost impervious area that makes it really hard for plant roots to penetrate. And, um, and then you also have just kind of a compressed pore space. So you don't have a lot of that ideal air and water 
um, exchange at that at that root level. And as a result, many of us get poor plant growth. Um, the good soil structure shown on the left is showing you that soft and crumbly soil uh, structure. And um, that's where you do have that pore space and that particles are kind of more loosely held together. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, good soil is going to mean great crops and healthy ornamentals in your garden. So the question is, how do we get there? Well, let's take a look at the, at the, um, at the science behind uh, good soil. Basically, uh, and many of you have already heard this, there's a, in a healthy soil sample, there's a, a massive amount of bacterial and fungal activity happening at the macroscopic or the microscopic level. The diagram at the bottom shows you sort of a perfectly functioning sample of soil at just 0.6 millimeters. You have a lot of, um, a lot of action going on. You have the plant, you have the fungal deb debris, um, you have the mycorrhizae fungal hyphae that are kind of connecting all of these processes. And you have organic material that is um, ensuring, you know, a good amount of air and water exchanged at that level. The reason why this is so important is that this type of um, activity in your soil protects plants from pathogens. The, these bacteria and these beneficial fungi uh, protect our plants from pathogens. They also help regulate what the plant needs to grow, the water uptake, the um, uh, availability of phosphorus and other micronutrients to that plant is governed by the health of this type of um, soil structure. In the long run and in, in the short run too, this type of um, healthy soil protects plants uh, from drought, makes them more drought tolerant. Um, and again, the way to get here is to continue adding that organic matter to your soil. You can see that top photo shows an example of the, um, of the symbiotic association between fungal uh, hyphae, the, the mycorrhizae and the plant root, and both are feeding each other. So again, the importance of adding organic material to your soil can help, especially in our area, restore that balance between uh, within your soil. It can help depleted and compacted and waterlogged soils um, kind of get back to equilibrium. Um, in turn, you're going to increase the nutrient availability to your plants, whether those are trees or vegetables or anything in between. You are going to boost your soil's ability to with to, um, to hold water uh, by adding organic material to it. Um, and the science says, uh, you know, plants that are growing in uh, soils with higher organic content uh, need fewer chemical inputs. So if you're trying to reduce your fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides, um, try adding organic material to your soil. Now, many of us have, um, you know, grown up using chemical fertilizers. What's the problem with that? Well, um, the chemical fertilizers are feeding your plants in the short run, but adding organic material to your soil is feeding them over the long run. Uh, remember that chemical fertilizers, many are made with um, synthetic and often petroleum derived products. So that's, um, uh, uh, you know, not helping your carbon footprint. Um, through overuse and um, frequent application, you can actually reduce the microbial activity in your soil by using chemical fertilizer. Um, uh, poor application rates or, or accidents can pollute water. And of course, um, you know, constant exposure of uh, people and pets to chemical fertilizers is not ideal. By using organic fertilizers, you're using, um, you're introducing naturally decaying materials back into your soil, whether that's vegetable scraps from the table, leaf, uh, leaf and uh, wood litter, uh, bone meal, things like that. Those are all naturally decaying um, uh, sources of uh, organic content. You're basically setting up a situation where your soil is offering a slow release um, uh, of plant nutrients to your plants. You're creating that nutrient rich uh, soil over the long run, and you're supporting the, the important microorganisms that should be in any healthy soil sample. And of course, um, organic fertilizers don't uh, pose the same threat to 
the environment or to your family or to your pets that chemical fertilizers do. So once we've got you on board with, uh, you know, kind of committing to building that soil, what can we do to protect that soil, right? The idea here is to cover and protect your bare soil. Um, you want to use mulch um, judiciously uh, to reduce evaporation and to help insulate plant roots, especially during the um, hot summer season. We recommend uh, the readily available leaf mulch or shredded bark mulch that's available through the county um, rather than the larger kind of chunkier bark mulch pieces um, that can actually have a, a water repellent quality to them, especially during heavy rains and can in fact kind of wash away off of your landscaping. Um, another strategy for vegetable gardeners is to use cover crops. Uh, winter cover crops can fix nitrogen, can uh, help stop erosion, cover your, cover your uh, soil. And in the springtime you can, um, or in the fall, you can clip them back and um, uh, reintroduce them back into your soil as a natural nitrogen source. We'll talk about mulching properly here because it's a big deal in suburban areas. Um, less is better, you know, maximum two or three inches deep. Um, try to avoid putting down things like landscape uh, cloth or, you know, a lot of newspaper because you're really interfering with the uh, water vapor exchange uh, in soil and you can create uh, problems by sort of locking in that moisture uh, below ground. Um, if you're mulching your trees, uh, pay attention to the fact that you want to keep that mulch about six inches away from the trunk flare where it hits the soil. Um, it, you should not be bringing it right up to the tree. You want to mulch all the way to the drip line, which is the outermost branches so that you're covering and protecting that entire root zone. And you want to mulch shallowly uh, and avoid these awful mulch volcanoes that some of us see uh, from time to time that are just horrific and, and actually bad for the trees. Another approach, uh, actually, if you have the room and the inclination is to try nature's mulching approach. And this is a great photo of Elaine's backyard where she has a uh, almost a woodland, natural woodland area where she's letting the leaves fall and stay. You're letting these fall, fall in the autumn and overwinter in place. Um, why is that important? Well, you're retaining, it's a sustainable practice, right? You are uh, providing protection to the soil. You're recycling those nutrients back into the soil. And during the um, heavy storms of the fall and winter, you are providing a, some, some uh, protection against erosion. It's a good way to save time, money, and effort. It's not for everyone, but maybe if you have a certain section of your yard that you're willing to allow this um, to, to take place, it can be really rewarding. And for, chiefly among those reasons is that allowing these leaves to stay in place provides excellent protection for uh, the larval stages of fireflies and lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths that we love to see in our gardens um, come spring. Another strategy to protecting the soil um, and protecting it against erosion is to use plants as a kind of an ongoing living green mulch. Um, the impact of using these uh, green mulch plants is that you're uh, shading the soil, you're keeping it a little bit cooler, you're discouraging weeds. Um, we have plenty of examples to choose from including herbaceous ground cover plants like this Allegheny spurge, which is a nice native alternative to Pachysandra. Um, and uh, these plants obviously offer a lot of interest and um, biodiversity to the garden. At the same time, we urge you to avoid uh, using these overused invasive ground covers um, such as English ivy, uh, Liriope, Periwinkle, and Pachysandra in your garden. So the final point is to really uh, think of the soil as a massive carbon sink. Um, so you want to disturb it as little as possible. Try to avoid uh, habits of yesteryear that included rototilling and, and massive digging. 
uh, which we know now is reintroducing uh, a lot of carbon back into the atmosphere. Um, try to plant small specimens, plant them closely together, um, grow your vegetables in raised beds if you can, avoid overuse of annual plants, and, uh, and weed gently. So that's it for the soil. So now let's talk about the lawn. And this is, um, this is kind of a interesting concept to just have everybody who lives in you know, single family homes rethink the idea of the American lawn. And the reason um, we are bringing this one up is because it's basically a, a massive uh, environmental problem. Lawns in the United States are not sustainable. They have huge environmental costs. They're, we're, they're basically massive uh, monocultures, barren of any uh, sort of biodiversity or ecological value. Um, they're the single largest irrigated crop in the United States, gobbling up 9 billion gallons of water every day. Uh, much of that is wasted through evaporation or leaky irrigation systems. They also require massive uh, inputs um, through uh, fertilizers and pesticides. And um, as we've said before, homeowners tend to apply uh, way more of these products per acre than uh, farmers do. And so you end up having a situation where these lawns are, um, you know, uh, shedding a lot of nitrogen into the Chesapeake Bay or, um, you know, are just rife with pesticides. The human costs of lawn care are not insignificant. The average American spends 70 hours a year um, mowing the grass, weed whacking the, the flower beds. Um, it's not cheap. Um, it's a chore and you're constantly exposing yourself if you apply chemicals to your lawn to toxic chemicals such as um, glyphosate or Roundup, which is probably one of the most pervasive um, herb herbicides used in the country, despite the fact that it does cause cancer. It's been shown to cause cancer. There have been multiple million dollar settlements um, with people who have uh, tied their cancers to the use of glyphosate. So uh, the human costs of lawn care are not insignificant either. The idea that we're proposing here is really to sort of in your, you know, reimagine what the purpose of having a lawn is. Reimagine uh, sort of redoing those ratios of your lawn to your garden um, and see what that would look like. Of course, you know, for families that have young children and you may wanna have that play area, that's fine. But for some um, areas, it's going to be enough to have a uh, lawn used for a footpath around a uh, heavily you know, traveled area or to use as an edging, um, such as in this photo where you're really showing off this beautiful um, flower bed and the lawn is really just kind of an accent. At a more intensive level, more intensive level of commitment to getting rid of the lawn, you can uh, think about replacing the lawn um, as part of a strategy to attract wildlife to your garden. Uh, there's huge potential to increase biodiversity just on your own property by replacing the lawn with, um, with, with plants. You can create these um, deep planting beds that have shrubs and perennials. You can put in native ornamental grasses um, instead of turf. You can think more broadly and install meadows if you have the room. Um, and at a, at a really transformative level, um, you can get rid of your turf altogether and pursue the strategy of um, installing kind of a multi-layered, multi-level uh, you know, landscape that includes trees and shrubs and ground covers and um, other herbaceous plants and herbs and things like that. And um, you'll see the birds and the bees and the pollinators come to your, to your garden pretty quickly. But many of us do still want this wide expanse of green um, in our backyards and, and that's fine. Um, we are here to tell you that there are some uh, turf grass alternatives that are maybe a little gent more gentle on the environment. Um, at our latitude, we're north of uh, 37 degrees latitude here in Arlington, um, uh, something called a no-mo fescue seed mix, which is a kind of um, 
perennial bunch grass that creates a very dense mat. Um, doesn't need a lot of mowing. It does well in um, uh, drought conditions. Uh, that's an alternative. It, you can mow it at different uh, heights. You can kind of leave it looking meadowish, or you can cut it shorter. Um, similarly, a mini clover um, is available for um, a stand-in for turf grass. And in this garden, you can see that it, you know, it grows very. Uh, it's a very short uh, clover. It doesn't need a lot of mowing. Um, and it attracts uh, butterflies and beneficial insects to your garden, like ladybugs and um, lace wings and things like that. At Glen Carlin uh, Demonstration Garden on display in the field just outside the garden, you can go and observe this, um, this native grass called poverty oak grass or Danthonia spicata. And we love this grass because it thrives in terrible soil which is what a lot of us have, uh, frankly. Um, it also attracts butterflies and um, is very sustainable. It's, it's native to uh, Virginia and much of the United States. And it's a, um, it's a, it's a great alternative to the uh, cool season grasses that many of us grow. And finally, uh, Pennsylvania sedge, uh, which might be appropriate for kind of a dry shade area where you're not getting a lot of foot traffic. This is also native um, to Virginia and um, is, a, is a nice alternative. But for those of us who are still committed to our turf, our you know, Kentucky bluegrass or whatever we have growing in the uh, backyard, um, one thing that we can do to make our grass more sustainable is to remember that you know, for the most part, turf grass root zones are just below the surface of your lawn. They don't extend deeply as you can see in these other um, examples of native plants that have much uh, deeper root zones. And as a result, um, they're not that sustainable. But one thing that you can do is simply set your lawnmower to a higher um, mower height, three and a half to four inches. And what that does, as you can see in the um, diagram, is it encourages the root zone to dig deeper into the ground uh, for water. Um, it promotes root, root growth. It increases the drought tolerance of your yard. And it uh, provides more shade to the soil and, um, and therefore discourages weeds. So that's a strategy for um, making, you know, so sort of greening your lawn um, if you don't want to replace it with um, native plants or other gardens. Some other practical tips for uh, reducing the environmental impact of your turf lawn. Uh, you know, get to know the difference between the cool season grasses and the warm season grasses. Because we are in a transition zone here in Virginia, um, neither of these types of these categories of grasses is going to look fabulous all year round. So get to understand the limitations of um, those grasses, know when they go dormant, and try to uh, hold back on the excessive watering that these grasses typically need. Uh, when you're mowing, you can retain your grass clippings on the lawn as a natural mulch. Um, add compost to uh, restore your soil structure and support the soil microbes in your grass. Um, aerate your lawn uh, once a year if you can to provide more oxygen to the root zone. Um, and uh, try to discontinue the use of polluting fertilizers and pesticides to your grass. And especially where we are uh, with a, another plug for the Chesapeake Bay, you're not supposed to add fertilizer to your lawn uh, between mid-November and the end of February. And the reason is because, you know, the intense uh, fall and winter storms that come, you know, just shove that fertilizer uh, back into the bay uh, with uh, terrible consequences for the blue crab population and other bay resources. So we'll pause there and take some questions um, before I hand this back to Elaine for the final climate change gardening strategy. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. That was a pretty dense section there. Um, <laughs> I know, it's a lot of information. <laughs> we have a question that connects your rain garden presentation to the mulch presentation. Someone asked, do you mulch a rain garden? And if so, what do you mulch it with? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't really know if you mulch a rain garden. I suppose maybe at the edges, but I, I, we can find that out and let you know. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, another attendee uh, trying to be good about not disturbing the soil is cutting weeds off at the surface multiple times, uh, hoping to leave all the good stuff in place. Is this a losing strategy? It's <laughs> a good question. <laughs> um, it, it can, I mean, weed seeds can live in soil for an extraordinarily long time. So I suppose if you're paying close attention to when those weeds are setting seeds and you're getting them before they go to seed, it's to your advantage. Um, but yeah, anything you can do to not rip this stuff out of the soil is more, is you're, you're leaving more carbon in the soil. I think they also were trying to be kind to the mycorrhizae. <laughs> right, right. Everyone, everyone's now thinking about that fungal hyphae under, underneath their feet, which yes. I think is a good thing. Um, there was an interesting question. One of the attendees has a woodland behind their house. The floor of it is covered with stilt grass. Mm. Now, the question is, should you try and get rid of the stilt grass because it's an invasive? Or is it better to leave it because it shades the ground and it's better than bare soil? Mm, that's a good question. I, I mean, know, I, these are good questions. Yeah, I don't know much about stilt grass. I would, <laughs> I would probably rip it out. <laughs> it's so invasive. I would probably rip it out and, and try, to, try to mulch it to discourage okay. further weed growth. Okay. I seem to remember, are you all talking about cardboard as a mulch around trees? We did not talk about that today. What what my, my comment was, um, so it can be a little bit confusing because I know that in many of our demonstration gardens where we're addressing things like, you know, kind of soggy pathways be, between um, garden beds, raised garden beds, um, some of us have taken, you know, huge pieces of cardboard and then over mulch them with wood chips to kind of stabilize the walkway yes. um, and to create a, you know, a safe place for people to walk. In yeah. that instance, um, that, that's a different situation than putting cardboard or newspaper or landscape cloth um, over a, a tree root zone, for example. We're, we're cautioning against that and, and in, encouraging people just to use straight mulch because you want to encourage uh, a more natural um, you know water vapor exchange uh, between the root zone and the atmosphere and and mm -hmm. and putting down thick cardboard can discourage that okay and um, the final question for this session was if you're someone who's interested in the no mo fescue or the mini clover do you have to dig up your current lawn and get down to bare soil to start these, or is there an alternative? Hmm. Good. That's a good question. Uh, we can look into that. I mean, I think we we'll look into that. I'm okay. not sure whether it's an overseeding area. Obviously, if you're starting from scratch, um, you know you can put these the seed down uh, from scratch. But if you have an established turf lawn. Um, we, we can find out for you what the, what the right strategy is, whether it's just a it's sort of a continuous overseeding approach. Um, some of these grasses, you know, grow so densely that they effectively crowd out um, other plants. And in this instance, the goal would be for it to crowd out, you know, the rye grasses and the, and the fescues. Um, the Kentucky bluegrasses and things like that. Uh, but we can look into what, what, a, what a, the right strategy would be and we'll include it in Elaine's um, addendum document. That's, okay. a great That's a great question though. I know these are all good. Okay, we can get back to the presentation. Okay, super. So I'm gonna hand the screen back to Elaine and she's going to talk about the last strategy which is um, making informed choices of plants for your climate resilient garden. As I've commented earlier, the warmer growing conditions are resulting in higher levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And this is very favorable to invasive non-native plants and can thereby cause harm to our environment. Just a few examples of popular invasive plants are the ground covers, English ivy, liriope, and periwinkle grasses like bamboo, Chinese silver grass, and fountain grass, 
shrubs like Barbary, Butterfly Bush, Nandina, and Rose of Sharon, and trees such as Calory Pear, Mimosa, Princess Tree, and Tree of Heaven. The problem is that many uh, of these plants are still being sold despite the fact that jurisdictions like Arlington and Alexandria, Virginia have lists of uh, plants that are designated as invasive. We bring them uh, innocently perhaps into our landscapes. They're very attractive there, but they can escape cultivation. The uh, seeds of these plants can be carried away. Fruits that are produced can be carried by birds into our natural areas, and there they will uh, threaten the ecosystems. Uh, some other issues that we're facing with plants because of increased disease problems and these extra generations of maturing insect pests means that our stressed plants could be affected. And so we're suggesting that you might want to look at some of the plants, perhaps boxwood or roses that are continually experiencing these problems are needing lots of extra chemical inputs and replacing them with some more sustainable plants. Uh, master gardeners have a mantra a right plant, right place. So this is simply a, a repetition of the idea that you want to site your plants properly. Uh, if it's a, a dry area that you're planting in, use a drought tolerant plant with a deep root system. If you've got a wet area, go for those rain garden plants. And we have, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the resources for that. And finally, we always recommend to do a soil test to determine pH because some plants, let's say um, rhododendrons and um, azaleas and blueberries, for example, need highly acidic soil. A very important strategy as far as uh, adding plants is to expand our tree canopy. And the reason for this are numerous. Trees provide many ecosystem services. They act as the lungs of our planet, producing the oxygen we breathe. They store carbon in their bodies and roots. The tree canopy that the different layers of foliage can slow the impact of these heavy rain events, which would be hitting the ground at about 25 miles an hour. Tree roots and leaf litter, as we've discussed already, improve the soil's ability to absorb that rainwater and hold it on our properties. And trees filter out pollutants, both the uh, toxic gases and uh, particulate matter. And just as one example, this hickory tree can filter out numerous gallons of water per year. Continuing with comments on planting trees, um, they provide shade and cool the air through transpiration, greatly reducing the heat island effect. And proper placement of shade trees can reduce our summer cooling costs by 20 to 30 percent. Locating evergreen trees on the north side of our property can greatly reduce the winds and thereby our winter heating costs. And landscapers tell us that healthy mature trees can increase our property values by 7 to 19 percent. I was very interested to read this study um, recently published in Plant People and Planet talking about what uh, are being labeled as native super trees. The trees were uh, measured for their urban heat island reduction, flood mitigation, reduction of air pollutants and carbon sequestration. And a number of them are native to our area. These are in order, red maple, tulip poplar, river birch, and the most protect protective is American sycamore. Uh, we're encouraging you to look out for opportunities to participate in tree canopy programs. I've been lucky enough to receive a free tree which was planted for me. And in doing this, adding these trees to the property, you want to site them carefully, uh, considering the spa uh, space around, the position of your home, any utilities, and you want to prune them carefully. Try to retain the natural form because that's going to uh, create less stress on the tree and require less water. If you're lucky enough to have mature trees on your property, really continue to look out for them. Remove these invasive vines, ivy, uh, Asian wisteria, and winter creeper. Minimize competition with turf grass. Turf grows in more alkaline soil. Trees, on the other hand, have that relationship with the fungi and bacteria. They prefer more acidic soil. And if you mulch properly, as Elizabeth explained, you'll be uh, 
preventing potential da damage to the trees with either mowers or string trimmers. Uh, remember to water your trees as well as your other plants during periods of drought. As we've discussed, remove snow and ice uh, to the extent possible during storms. Avoid damage during any construction projects and think seriously about consulting certified arborists to maintain proper pruning. We've talked about some techniques for helping in your vegetable gardens, use of uh, cover crops, row covers, raised beds, um, drip irrigation, and our extension agent, Kirsten, has some recommendations on planting resilient vegetable plants. Uh, you can buy seeds for plants with built-in disease resistance. An example here is the tomato plant. These can be um, resistant to various um, viruses and, um, and nematodes, for example. You can look for cultivars with a shorter reproductive cycle, uh, cultivars that flower at cooler times of the day or even at night. And she also recommends looking for some heat tolerant varieties and vegetables from hot climates. This might include taro, cassava, bok choy, uh, salon spinach. Another possibility is to add perennial vegetables. You won't be digging these up and replacing them every year. And examples of those would be artichokes, asparagus, uh, this Eastern prickly pear native cactus where you can eat the, both the pads and the fruits. And this would help um, you contribute to a practice of permaculture. Uh, I personally highly recommend uh, using native plants in your ornamental landscaping. These plants are adapted to our local conditions, uh, our soil types, our hydrology, and they tend, as we showed in that one diagram, to have very deep root systems. There are numerous species uh, that with many ornamental qualities that are locally available. And most importantly, these plants are going to provide support to our wildlife through nectar, pollen, seeds, fruit, and cover. And uh, this is especially important for our endangered pollinators and birds. And as we've mentioned, buy from reputable native plant nurseries that are not going to be using these systemic um, insecticides. Doug Tallamy, uh, a professor at the University of Delaware, his uh, graduate student, Desiree Naranko, partnered with Peter Mera uh, not too long ago. He's from the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. And they conducted a study uh, right here in our DC region. And the result of that study was their conclusion that an ideal landscape would include a biomass of 70% native plants. And Doug Tallamy is an entomologist, so he understands that insects are really the essential components of nature's food webs. And caterpillars, the larval stage of our native butterflies and moths, their presence is an index of the health of ecosystems. And the reason for this is that 96% of our birds feed this uh, stage of, of uh, insects, the caterpillars, easily digestible. They're feeding them to their young. So they discovered that landscapes that had a high percentage of native plants were able to provide the foliage that was preferred by these caterpillars. And then the caterpillars in turn fed the birds, for example, the chickadees, and they were able to have successful nesting and keep their populations steady. Now, even if you build up your supply of native plants on your property, that still allows you 30% of your benign uh, traditional non-native uh, uh, species, some of your, your traditional favorites. Now, uh, Continuing with that topic of providing support to that caterpillar stage, Doug Tallamy has uh, highlighted certain species as what he terms keystone species. These additionally will provide nectar, pollen, fruit, and nuts to, to our other kinds of wildlife. But for this, this important larval stage of caterpillars, these would be the top woody plants. And woody plants, of course, are going to add greater biomass to our properties uh, more easily. So the oak species are really the most uh, supportive, supporting over 500 species of butterflies and moths. Uh, and they are followed by the cherries and the willows. 
And then these other species of trees and shrubs are also uh, among the top keystone species. Equally important is to look to our herbaceous plants and the top keystone species of herbaceous plants here are golden rods, asters, and sunflowers. And these species are additionally important because they are going to provide late season fall uh, nectar and pollen to our pollinators. And other important uh, keystone species of uh, herbaceous type are sedges, the bone sets and joe pies, violets, geraniums, black-eyed Susans, and milkweeds. I generally recommend using the so-called straight species, the, the, the native uh, form of a plant over the cultivars. These are plant varieties that are produced through selective breeding. And generally this breeding is done for human convenience and enjoyment, especially the aesthetic qualities of plants. Unfortunately, we're not taking our wildlife into account. Now, of course, many of us have smaller yards. And so it's generally found that the smaller cultivars can be acceptable. Some of the problems occur when there are major changes to the foliage and the flowers. So an example would be a change of the leaf color. Uh, here with our native arrowwood, the, uh, the straight species has leaves filled with green chlorophyll. When it's changed this very attractive uh, burgundy color in the red feather cultivar, that foliage can no longer be used as a larval host plant. Caterpillars will not recognize that and be able to feed on that. Equally important is to stay away from plants that have large showy blossoms that are offering fewer floral resources. Uh, two examples, one is wild hydrangea. You can see in the top picture, the straight species has a many sexual parts to the plants. The, the, you can see the anthers where the pollen is being offered. And this lovely Annabelle cultivar is beautiful, but the flowers are sterile. They're not providing nectar or pollen. The plant uh, that in the horticulture trade that probably is most um, hybridized is purple coneflower. And I urge you to go for the straight species which has these complex flowers with a very prominent central cone. As you can see, the, uh, the insects are going to that part of the plant for the pollen and the nectar. When that central cone is replaced by extra petals, as in this double delight cultivar, the, the, the uh, sources of nectar and pollen are completely omitted. Additionally, cultivars are generally reproduced clonally by cuttings not sexually, so they are less adaptable to changing climate conditions. And a few more tips um, when using your native plants or at plants in general, a uh, plant with wildlife in mind. We've already referred to the concept of planting with layers of vegetation. And this is because different types of wildlife, this, this uh, chart shows birds, they are going to use different levels of, of plants. Um, when you're planting your herbaceous plants, try to mass them in drifts. This is really, really beneficial for our pollinators. When flying over, they will recognize these larger groupings and they'll be able to, uh, to do their nectaring in a more efficient manner. And uh, landscape designers generally recommend that when you're doing this massing, uh, create multiples of three, five, and seven. These are, are generally con considered the most attractive. Uh, finally, you want to be including protection for the native insects, and you can use the plants as we've discussed to do that. Retain your fallen leaves for overing, overwintering insects. Now we've generally talked about keeping bare soil, but you might want to leave some bare soil, especially if you have sloping areas with sandy soil. Um, leave them bare for native ground dwelling bees. 70% of our native bees are ground dwelling. You can also retain the stems, the larger stems of some of our herbaceous plants. Uh, these can be used by cavity nesters. And what you do is you keep the plants up for ornamental interest over the winter. Then in the spring, you cut them back. New foliage will grow over that, but then the, uh, the open stems can be used by our cavity nesting bees. 
So uh, in conclusion, we sincerely hope that the strategies that we've presented today, um, minimizing your carbon footprint, dealing wisely with water, building your soil, thinking differently about your lawn, and making informed choices of plants will help build your confidence in feeling that you really can be climate conscious gardeners, gardening sustainably, gardening for wildlife, and really partnering with nature. And finally, uh, in conclusion, um, I created a, a two page handout. That was one of the uh, links that was sent to you. And this will allow you to go into much more detail, for example, on the topic of creating those rain gardens. But I'm just going to highlight a few of the resources that you may find the most helpful. Uh, several books that I really have enjoyed for inspiration. These two books are absolutely fantastic. They go into even more detail, uh, breaking it down point by point about uh, climate-wise landscaping techniques. If you would like to learn more about native plants on our Master Gardeners website, we have fact sheets on well over 100 native plants. Um, we've also created sheets that we call best bets for different types of specific conditions. And we have, um, well over 30 presentations on every kind of uh, aspect of native plants by season, by type. There are two other websites that I draw your attention to. One is the Native Plant Finder. Uh, Doug Tellamy partnered um, with the National Wildlife Federation and you can enter your zip code and determine which plants uh, might be the most supportive in your region for the important caterpillar stage of butterflies and moths. You're supporting the entire life cycle of those desirable insects. And a North Carolina extension has a wonderful plant toolbox and you can look uh, on the sidebar and uh, it acts as a database and you can indicate what particular wildlife you'd like to attract and it will generate lists for you. Um, we've talked briefly about invasive plants. Uh, for Arlington and Alexandria, we've provided links, uh, the lists of these invasive plants, and I've also created uh, fact sheets for the most prevalent plants, the ones that are purchased the most often, and we also give some suggestions on how you can con control these plants. And finally, a couple uh, other sites you can go to to get advice and participate in a more active way. Plant Nova Natives has a, a campaign to try to increase the use of native plants in Northern Virginia. They have a guide, videos, and you can also learn on their website exactly where to go to buy native plants. Virginia Native Plant Society uh, helps, of course, conserve our natural areas. They offer lectures and tours throughout the year, and they always have a featured wild, uh, wildflower of the year. Locally, we have an Audubon at Home program. You can arrange for home visits with an Audubon ambassador, and you can even go as far as certifying your property as a wildlife sanctuary. And finally, if you're inspired by Doug Tallamy, you may want to register your own property uh, as a planting on the map for the homegrown national park. And uh, we have a few other helpful resources uh, from Virginia Cooperative Extension. Our help desk can um, be contacted. I'm sure D Jason has provided the contact information in the chat. Uh, you can consult at our plant clinics, which uh, occur at farmer's markets. We invite you to visit our demonstration gardens where you can see a lot of these plants and climate uh, conscious practices in demonstration and uh, continue to register for additional classes. Okay, I'm ready for any final questions, Colleen. Um, Elaine, there were no final questions, if you can believe it. <laughs> I think everyone was just uh, so um, impressed with how comprehensive uh, this whole presentation was. And uh, I think you've uh, taught people so much about native plants already that um, <laughs> maybe there were no questions from that section. Uh, probably five or six people have had to leave and they all said to say thank you and Elizabeth so much for such a comprehensive and wonderfully informative talk.
Well, you're yeah. very welcome. And I want to let everyone know that uh, I will be working personally on the closed captioning for the recording of this presentation. It will be back up on our website should you want to refer to any sections of it again. Uh, all of the links to the handouts will be there. And as we've mentioned, any of the questions that we haven't been able to address completely, uh, we will look further into those, do research and uh, send out to all of you directly an email message with this addendum information. Thank you so much and happy gardening to all of you. Thank you, Elaine.